Well, hello and welcome to Corruption Chronicles. This is a podcast that grew out of my book that you can see in the back room, background, The Happiest Corruption, Sleaze, Lies, and Suicide in a California Beach Town. And that was my story of the corruption I found when I became the mayor of my town. Before I introduce our guest, I do want to recognize and thank our podcast host, LJ Stead of Purple Banter. And um, I've asked LJ to jump in at any point. We may not have a picture, but if you hear a disembodied voice, um, that will probably be LJ. And I'm delighted to have him make any comments he likes. The Corruption Chronicles podcast tells the stories of government corruption and how everyday people fix it. And eight years ago, just three days before my mother died, or sorry, three weeks before my mother died, she told me that her parents in Kansas City had been part of a group of people who had ousted a corrupt political machine by starting a new political party. And that really surprised me because my parents, my grandparents, as far as I could remember, had been staunch Republicans. And she said that the corruption had to do with narcotics trafficking, but she'd been a little girl at the time, and that's all she could remember. So when I started Googling to find it, I found nothing. And then when I started to write my book, all of a sudden I found a thesis from the University of Birmingham that they'd posted, and the thesis was written by John Matlin, PhD, and it was called Political Party Machines of the 1920s and 30s. Tom Pendergast and the Kansas City Democratic Machine. And it really brings to life the early 20th century uh, city histories, but also women's suffrage, political action, investigative journalism or muckraking, voting rights of African-American men because women couldn't vote until 1925, the first progressives, political corruption, and all of those things are still forefront today. I could have been reading a newspaper today. So I tell the story about all of this in chapter nine in The Happiest Corruption, Sleaze, Lies, and Suicide in a California Beach Town. And you can find that on Amazon online or also at Barnes & Noble online. Um, And I tell the story because people think that you can't beat City Hall. And it's not true. You can beat City Hall. And I want to tell you how. And this particular story of the Kansas City corruption included Boss Tweed of Tammany Hall, uh, the gangster John Lazia, and um, Franklin D. Roosevelt, even Harry Truman, and the good citizens of Kansas City who turned around the corruption. So today, John Matlin is joining us from Great Britain, and he's agreed to discuss corruption and how it's taken down. And I want to thank you so much, Dr. Matlin, for joining us. And um, I, I'm actually in my second home in Hawaii right now, and it's about it's hot. I'm hot. It's about 81 degrees, and it's seven in the morning, eight in the morning. So, what time is it for you, and where, and and what, what's your temperature like? Well, I, I'm. I'm in London and it's seven o'clock at night and it's it's not quite 30 degrees. It's I think it's 28 or 29 at the moment. It's very steamy. Well, the only way I ever learned, even though I lived in Britain for 20 years, the only way I figured out how to do um, Celsius and Fahrenheit was, th- let's see, 28 is equal to 82. You transpose those well, digits. You double, so it add, double it and add 30. Oh my gosh, that's too much work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that while I'm trying to yeah, do a well, podcast. Oh my <laughs> anyway. you, you sound like my daughters. <laughs> well, yeah, if it's 28, it's 82. So yeah. that, I'm glad it's 28 there. Um, so one of the things that that was going on in Kansas City um, was it wasn't just drugs. And, and I, I do remember seeing um, some statistics at some point that talked about um, there being a lot of narcotics. And I think that was more through organized crime than it was through Tom Pendergast. Um, but the other thing was that they had what's called a political machine. And I wonder if you could um, just tell us a little bit more about what you know about what was going on. And then, and then maybe to uh, give us a little, tell us a little bit about what's a political machine. With pleasure. Um, well, thank you very much for asking me to join you. I've, I've read your book. Um, I'd like to say I enjoyed it immensely, but I didn't. It brought, <laughs> it brought chills. It, it, it brought back memories 
of the research and how um, how things can go very badly wrong if good people don't stand up. Um, but it's a very well-written book and well-researched, and um, I recommend those who haven't bought a copy yet, go ahead and buy one. Thank Anyhow, you. So before I'm going to jump in and cheat. I'm going to cheat here. Okay. Because... <laughs> Can I call you John instead of, of Dr. Course. Matlin? Oh, I want everybody do. to know. <laughs> oh, so Dr. Do. Matlin is a retired attorney. And um, and so when he says things like that, it means a lot to me. And he's also written, I think, four books now. And I really enjoyed his books. And they were particularly fun because they were based on um the press and the press and corrupt corrupt cities in the United States. And he was in the US a lot because that was his. The, uh, st that's what his study was. So um, I just wanted to jump in and say, if you like the happiest corruption or uh, on the other side, if you like John's books, you're going to like mine. <laughs> but if you like mine, you'll like his. <laughs> yeah, so, but, I'm sorry, uh, I interrupted you there. Not at all, not at all. But I, I, I would mention that mine are novels. They're mm -hmm. works of imagination. There's, there's not much fact in them. Anyway, before I start answering your questions, can I emphasize that my expertise regarding corruption is limited to academic study. Um, I've tried to stay on the right side of the law if I can. I, I haven't put any of my knowledge into practice. Um, so who was Tom Pendergast? Well, effectively, he was the head of the Kansas City Democratic Party for more than 25 years. And what is a political party machine? Well, it's a monopoly business that makes vast profits derived from repetitive, improper, and corrupt abuse of politics and the use of government levers, where the profits are allocated largely amongst a small group of senior and undeserving people. The existence of a city tax base and infrastructure was seen as an opportunity to be exploited to a machine's financial advantage. So you get a double standard emerging in American public life. The people who were elected assumed they were entitled to things that those who elected them were not. How does a machine operate? Well, um, one word you could use is favoritism. The popular word in the States is called patronage, but that's a nice way to put it. It's the use of material inducements and threats as the machine becomes a widespread party organization but it's not related to politics, it's related to the retention of power. A machine is a non-ideological organization interested little in political principle, but the key is securing and holding office for its leaders and distributing the income to those who run it and those who work for it. They're tightly organized, and the members and followers seem to be motivated by material incentives like money, gifts, favors, where votes, money, and control over public authority are the basic elements. But please remember, I'm talking now of the interwar years, the 20s and 30s. Um, however, my life as a lawyer and my study of human nature tells me that there's very little difference between the ancient Chinese civilization of 700 BC and now. People you know, don't it, seem to change. I'm really intrigued that you say that because the, I, I just, it was a hundred years ago. And for me, it was deja vu. What I read about in your thesis. And then in, in, I really, I, I, I borrowed your whole bibliography and research for my book. Thank you very much. You did oh, a lot look, I'm, I'm so pleased all that work hasn't <laughs> gone to waste. 
Oh, no, <laughs> you saved me. a lot. Well, I was going to say you saved me a lot of time, but you didn't really because I had to read all of those books. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no, well, when I say I had to, I have to, I mean, I couldn't resist reading all those books. They were really fascinating. But but going back to what you say, the reason I have asked you to speak on this and the specific questions that I asked you that you're addressing um, was because the things that you talked about in your thesis and, and I talk about in my book and we're discussing today are exactly what happened in my town and mm. my county. And then as I researched it and I looked at another town I'd lived in, Fresno, California, uh, I realized that Kansas City, Fresno, Grover Beach, and it sounds like the UK too, it's all the same. The methods are the same. The situations are the same. And um, as you say, it was kind of distressing to look at it all. And and it is distressing. Um, so I, I I cut in again there and, and I wanted to um, continue to hear from you. Um, did you have more on that? Or the other thing I, I wondered about, if, if you didn't have more to say on that chain there, was um, how how did they get into power? Who, who appointed them? Um, and I'm talking about in, the machine boss, so Pendergast. You have so to. Who appointed well, him? I, I, I looked carefully at two different machines. Uh, it was Tom Pendergast in Kansas City and Frank Haig in Jersey City. Mm. Um, there were an awful lot of similarities, but if you do a compare a contrast exercise, Pendergast was very much in the background. Um, you, if you read the local newspapers, he hardly ever gets a mention mm. until he runs into trouble. Uh, but before then, he's mentioned certainly at Christmas time every year, where supposedly he hosts a dinner for the poor of Kansas City, and the restaurants feed anything between two and four thousand people in that day. If you look, if you scratch beneath the surface, what you find is that Pendergast called in all sorts of favors and threats. So he didn't put a penny up himself. It was the restaurants and others who paid for it. Now compare that with Frank Haig. He was the mayor of Jersey City, very much the front man. Um, every election time, he would kick off with a huge tax cut for property taxes. He then had huge parades with marching bands and everything. He is very much the showman. So to that extent, um, you can see two very, very different characters. Who was Tom Pendergast? Um, he grew up in St. Joe. He was one of five brothers. And when he was, I think, 14, he was sent to Kansas City, where his big brother, Jim, owned a owned an inn in the poorest part of Kansas City called The Bottoms. Um, Jim was by then uh, an alderman in the city and a name in the Democratic Party. When Tom joined him, Tom had one particular use. He was a big lad and he was pretty good with his fists. So he became the enforcer. He was introduced into politics, grew through the ranks. And when Jim became ill and subsequently died, Tom took over the inns, the booze business, and other things, uh, including a courier business, believe it or not. Um, and he got himself elected. And he must have been he must have had some attractions as an individual because he soon became head of the Democrats and he became mayor of Kansas City, uh, where he served, I think, for one term and then said, no, this job isn't for me. I, this is not how I do things. I'm going to be the chairman of the Democratic Committee. I'll let somebody else lead from the front. 
Hmm. Basically, what that meant was he could do all the dirty stuff he wanted to do behind closed doors. So, the, as I say, very, very different characters. Um, I think it's worth saying, though, that uh, you've got to try and balance things. It wasn't that the machine did everything bad and nothing good. What the machine did was take care of the poor. Now, unlike today, when America has a very strong middle class in its cities, back in the 20s, there were the rich and the poor, and not that many in between. Mm. There were a lot of poor people, a lot of immigrants, and he would provide them with jobs, housing, clothing, medical assistance, and food all funded from his methods <laughs> with government, illegal or otherwise. But what he demanded in exchange, and he got in exchange, was votes. There were local elections every two years. And every two years, boy, these people came out and voted. Um, there was a saying in St. Louis that when... Uh, Pendergast wanted to elect someone to the state offices. He would see how big the vote was in St. Louis first, and then he'd make sure that he had sufficient votes out of Kansas City. Uh, but that's <laughs> apocryphal. I don't know how true that is. Wow, wow. Um, but it's, it, it, as I say, it's, you've got to balance. There, there, was, there was some good. And when... When the Great Depression hit, um, Hoover sat on his ample bottom and did nothing. He put in one measure, which was hopeless. Um, he gave the problem to the states who couldn't afford to cope with the problems. Um, the states turned to the charities who soon ran out of money. Pendergast took over. And during the, the Depression, and I've, I've actually checked the census, the unemployment rate in Kansas City during the 30s was 1.5%. Wow. Yeah. The because norm, we're doing all that the norm in America was anything between 25 and 33%. He got poor people working so they could put food on the table. So it's, it's not entirely bad, but what he yeah. did to achieve it is entirely bad. Well, and I think that the motive for doing it as well, unfortunately, his motivation, I, as far as I could tell, was, was money and power. It was greed. And I know you'd mentioned in a previous email, um, you know, why, why did he keep doing this? Why did he need more money? And, and from everything I could tell, he had a really serious addiction to gambling, which um, it's interesting because it was gambling that brought his brother, Jim, the pub or the, the bar that, that he, that uh, Tom went to work in and, and brother Jim could handle his gambling. Uh, Tom Pendergast, the boss could not handle his gambling. And in the end, I, I think he died um, having very little money left. He, he'd, and the reason he, his graft got bigger and bigger and bigger was because he needed more and more and more to pay off his gambling debts. That's about all he had left. His family seemed to have pretty much abandoned him. So and I, it's I, interesting I'm, to me. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure about um, losing all his money, but I know his nickname amongst the bookies was The Mug. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and, and he would he would occasionally he'd lose as much as ten thousand dollars in a week. Um, and you multiply that is, by twenty to get this is nineteen thirties money. This was mm -hmm. you know the it was beyond addiction, mm -hmm. and it can only be because he was so bored with his life. He needed an outlet. Um, so I think you're more charitable than I am. <laughs> well, I am. Um, I I wanted to talk a little bit about the the local press, and what you talked a lot in your thesis about the press and about um, you know their failure to to write about 
the corruption and uh, maybe some of the reasons they didn't. And I, I wondered if, if did you find that? I don't know if you actually researched this or not or, or had this experience, but did you find that that was true in other cities or did it only seem to be Kansas City that wouldn't write about their corruption? Um, I think... I think that in the 20s and 30s, um, it was standard. Uh, I found very little in the Jersey City newspapers mm. that was critical of Frank Haig. And there's a story about him. It is reckoned that during his lifetime, he would have owned over two thirds of the land in Jersey City and surrounding counties all through insider dealing. This pot of land is coming up for development. I'll buy it, then I'll sell it <laughs> on for a vast profit. You know. Wow. I know, so I know. Um, but what I can do is bring you into, all right, 50 years ago. Um, I, for my undergraduate degree, You've got to remember, I, 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 did, I, um, I had my university career after law, not before. <laughs> um, wow. And when I went to university, I, I fancied writing my uh, undergraduate dissertation on Watergate. Mm. And I was very lucky. I got to interview wow. some fantastic newspaper people, including Ben Bradley. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what was clear to me was from looking at the newspapers, the, the break-in happens in June of 1972. The cover-up holds together until the beginning of 1974. The newspapers don't get it. They just don't get it. It's a federal judge who causes the bubble to burst. Wow. But the newspapers don't get the story, and that includes the Washington Post. And I think part of the reason is it's very, very difficult to catch. Where do you get your evidence from? Because business people aren't going to talk because they'll be scared of what will happen to them if they do. The machine's not going to talk. So the cover-up's mm. just, just there. Wow. But so I, I, th I think this applies with newspapers the world over. Wow, that is surprising. Now it makes me want to go back because one of the things that had made me so proud of my grandfather was I remember right after my grandmother died, we took a long car trip from Kansas City to Arizona. And I, I was oh. the one who got to drive him. And um, he was telling me about he he was I think he wanted me to know because he knew I was a little bit left of Republican at the time. I still am, but um, he, I think he wanted me to understand what he had done. And he and a group of businessmen from Kansas City had actually gone up to tell Nixon um, that he'd better knock it off. He'd better start behaving himself or they were going to withdraw their support. And and I guess um, it's recorded in Nixon's diary. I found that online, too. So I, I did put a, a copy of that. I think. But yeah, I think I did put that in the book. And. I'm now I'm really dying to know what date that was. I'll have to check that out. I wondered if he <laughs> knew before the newspapers knew. Anyway, uh, but, uh, just a side. but you know, there, there are, at the time, I suppose, I could have chosen to read 20 Kansas newspapers. There were a lot of them. And I picked on the Kansas City Star, which is the biggest newspaper locally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it takes an awful long time to read newspapers. My, I, I gave myself a month to go to Missouri to read the papers. Wow. And frankly, I ran out of time. I managed to catch everything until Pendergast was prosecuted for income tax evasion and sentenced and his death. Um, but I don't know what happened in Kansas City after that. Although having visited the place, it looked pretty prosperous to me. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I have a, yeah, I have memories I, as a little girl of 
of going to downtown Kansas City and my mother talking about skyscrapers. Skyscrapers were the big thing then <laughs> in the early 60s. And um, and also the the amazing plaza and the amazing department stores and and um all the things that Pendergast built and his cement companies built. And it wasn't Pendergast alone, but but you know, the things that kept people in jobs during the depression. And uh, it it certainly is a testament to the importance of of public works and infrastructure in putting people in jobs. Um, but one, once again, if you, you talk about cement, um, Pendergast had a company called Ready Mix Concrete. Um, he was very proud of his product. Hmm. Um, making cement is not easy. No, it's, it's not. A difficult not. scientific process. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> He's on record as saying, if anything that I deliver goes wrong, I will fix it. And he did. Oh, really? Yeah. He, uh, he, wow. he, in he had a very interesting uh, relationship with Harry Truman. Yes. If you want to get into that. Um, sure. Yeah, if you've got time, let's do that. Oh, yeah. yes. Well, um, <laughs> you'll see me go a bit green when I get – we haven't had dinner yet, so <laughs> – you know, no, 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 no. I'm not having, just holler. No, it's all right. My, my Lin, Linda won't mind. Um, thank you, Linda. <laughs> when, when Truman um, came out of the army in 1918, it was the first time he'd made a success of anything in his life. He had a tremendous war in that none of the people. Uh, in his in his battalion were killed, and that was partly due to his very clever soldiering. But he came back. He opened the haberdashery. That went bust. He paid off all his creditors. It took him time, but by the twenties, he had a wife. He had a daughter, and no job and no money. But he had a friend he'd made in um, the army who was Pendergast's nephew. Oh. And, and the nephew introduced him to Pendergast, who saw that Harry had good organizational skills. And he appointed Harry as what was called county judge. And the county judge's job was to, to decide um, where new roads would go hmm. and who would build them. If you read some of Truman's biographies, he's quoted, uh, actually it's in, in his diaries, there was one where he said, I had to give those sons of bitches another damn contract <laughs> and I hated it. But at least I saved a few million dollars. I, he, he, <laughs> well, I, he, I he recall, had a tough time. Yeah, and he was known for, as I recall, one of his projects, he, he installed significantly more county roads than they had budgeted, than they thought they would install. And he came in under budget and he had so much money left that he was able to um, have a big celebration of it with a bunch of, uh, with the locals. And he held it at a Jewish venue. So the guy, you know, his, it was the Catholics who gave him a job. He did an incredible job of, of, um, of doing roads. And then he held an event for the whole city at a Jewish venue. So the guy was, was pretty cool. I mean, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know people were cool in the twenties and thirties. He's, he's got an interesting record on race, Harry Truman. Um, but he, when he's president, he does try to do something but he knows that he can't get the Southern Democrats mm. to side with him. Um, but I think he's the best president you've ever had. So, uh, but now, with Truman his flaws. Truman was from Missouri. It was Eisenhower who was from Kansas. Eisenhower yeah. was from the town that my grandparents were from. And, you know, <laughs> there was a, and it was the same in Britain. In that era, there was a real legacy of integrity. And I, I don't think it's just... I don't think it's just that we remember the past, you know, with with 
I'm trying to think what I'm trying to, rose tinted glasses. I think that there really was, uh, they call it the greatest generation. I think there was uh, um, a culture of integrity at that point, at that time. What do you think? You're an attorney, I'd maybe I'd, I'd, I'd more agree. greatest than I am. I'd agree with you. Um, mm -hmm. But there's, there's I, I, one of my favorite stories about Truman. Um, by this time, he's now a US Senator. And when Pendergast died, Harry told uh, he told his people, "I'm going to the funeral," and they said, "No, no, don't do that." He's, you know, you're going to the funeral of a man who's in disgrace. And the quote I've got is Truman saying, "He was my friend in life; I'll be his friend in death." Mm. You know, he had he had great yeah. values. He had blind spots too. Sure, uh, sure. I'd never have played poker with him. <laughs> he just skinned me alive. <laughs> In poker, I didn't know he was a good poker player. Oh, wow! Gosh. <laughs> so we we I we had been talking about the newspapers a bit, and um, I'm wondering, it, do you have any thoughts on why the newspapers didn't cover uh, the corruption that they were seeing? I think it, I think it's I think there's a Faustian bargain. I've got no evidence of this. The one, the one flaw in my thesis, um, which fortunately my examiners didn't point to, was that I had very, very little contemporaneous evidence because everybody who'd worked in the machine had died by the time I looked at it. Um, but my, my guess is this. Pendergast would have known the newspaper proprietors and would have explain to them in very nice terms that I'm going to use. You leave me alone, and I'll leave you alone. You really don't want me interfering with your advertisers, do you? And I can't stop the criminal activities in this city and prevent your children from being kidnapped. And kidnapping was a business. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, not to mention damage to buildings. So I would think there was a, a deal done. Mm, yeah. Where, where the newspapers <laughs> accepted the real, well, what Kissinger would call the real politique. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So I'm going to switch, switch channels on you a little bit here. Um, so all this was going on in Kansas City. And as as I think I'm correct in saying, as as children, we're all taught in in the United States, and we believe it. I hear people saying it, and I believed it that our system has checks and balances. That there's three branches: there's the legislative, which makes the laws; there's the judicial, which um, interprets the laws; and then there is the executive, which carries out the laws. And I know I know that's true at the national level. Um, because we talk about the national level, we learn about that in school. And then I know that there is, I know that's true at the state level because I, I can observe that even more so at the state level. And even within those, they built in checks and balances. And then we get to the city level. And I'm wondering if 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 you can if you have any thoughts about checks and balances and how that comes down to the city level. I'm on I'm on very dangerous ground here because I know that. Uh... Those who watch this podcast, many of them re will regard the Constitution as something that's sacrosanct. And I'm well, an let's admirer. Let's hear from someone outside. You say what you really think. I want to hear. I'm, I'm, I'm an admirer of the Constitution <laughs> for the time it was written, but it's got some glaring omissions. For example, mm -hmm. where's a provision for one person, one vote? It's not in the Constitution. In fact, is in every state constitution. And um, don't get me started on the Second Amendment. Sorry, are you or, saying that that the um, the one person one vote is or is not in the state amend in the state constitution? It is in the state constitution. It, it is, is in, in state. the state. Yes, but, but not, not federal. federal. Right. No. That's right. We have an electoral college that votes how they wish. And I, I think the the Bill of Rights is a most damaging of documents. We're discussing having one in the UK. 
And I'm on record with our legislators saying, please, if you're going to insist on a Bill of Rights, add the words and responsibilities to it. You can't just give people what they want unless they're going to act responsibly to do so. But having said that, the Constitution didn't cover how cities and towns were going to be governed. Um, it's just not there. The best you can do is to look at the Tenth Amendment and states' rights. Now, I can't give you any sensible explanation as to why the framers ignored this, but I would put this to you. Um, shortly before the War of Independence, I'll call it that, for this, well, the War of Rebellion. We're um, friends now. We're friends <laughs> now. Uh, only, <laughs> well, I wish you'd tell that to Mr. Biden. Um, but if, if, if you look at position very shortly before the civil, uh, before the War of Independence, um, London has a population of around 700,000. Paris is bigger, 750,000. And the biggest American city is Boston. With Eight thousand. Yeah, I remember looking at that and being very surprised. So, um, ruling of towns and cities back in the 1790s, I'm sure, was not an issue. Uh, certainly, the uh, self-evident truth of liberty, as in the Declaration of Independence, didn't extend to municipal governments. Um, but now, you know this far better than I do. You're dealing with what I call retail politics. We want to know how our roads are going to be maintained, how the streets are going to be lit, where are the sewers going to be, and are they going to work? Who's going to maintain them? What about rights to build on land? All these issues. Mm -hmm. And all of this is done at local level. And it's paid for by the taxes levied at local level. And how is this administered? Well, some states have laws covered. Some states have given charters to cities. The charters aren't uniform. And they are there to be abused. If you look at what Pendergast did, um, he changed, he changed um, the charter, well, he, the machine changed the Kansas City Charter um, in such a way that it was almost automatic that the Democratic Party would be the majority party in <laughs> Kansas City yeah. for year after year after year. It's very well, that difficult. And ghost to voters. He would have sometimes seven <laughs> people voting from one or you know, voting from one vacant lot. But yes. <laughs> well, they're not only ghost voters, they're repeaters. You know, mm -hmm. the mantra of vote early, vote often is American. But my favorite is always ballot box stuffing. Mm -hmm. You know about this. This is where at the end of just before the polls close, in comes some. <laughs> gangsters from the machine. They remove the ballot boxes that have been collected and replace them with one they've already prepared. Oh, no, I did not know that. Story. Oh, yeah. There was a case about this in um, Chicago uh, about 15 years ago where this was oh, done. 15? Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah, you it know, I, I don't think we're writing about those things. It, it's my, you know, I always say government I, hates a brew. Ha -ha. <laughs> they probably didn't write about that. I'm trying to remember the name of the governor, uh, something bitch, and he went inside because of it. Yes, that's, I do remember that, but I guess I didn't realize. Well, part of, part of the, part of the offense, part of, it. part of the offenses that he committed was ballot box stuffing. Oh, my, that's good. I'm glad he went inside for that. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked a little bit about, well, let me go back to this one first before I move on. But um, I, I think 
I assumed, and we all, I, I'm going to say we all assume in the United States that all of our government has checks and balances. And I suddenly discovered, I'd forgotten that I'd read it in your thesis, because at the time I read your thesis, I was more interested in the history of Kansas City. Um, but I, I really thought, I started looking at it and I realized we have, we do not have checks and balances at the local level. I certainly, in my city, the legislative is the uh, city council. They choose the city attorney who is actually more of a, a corporate attorney. He's, uh, he's on the executive side. They choose the other executive chief executive officer, which is the city manager. The city manager hires the police who are also actually under the executive side. There's really no judicial in big cities there might be, but in ours, it's left up to the county and the county ignored all kinds of infractions for decades, if not longer, for as long as I know. And so you have the executive that, or you have the legislative chooses the executive who will not stand up to the legislative because if they do, they lose their jobs. They instead will kowtow to the city council majority. Um, so there's no checks and balances. There are no checks and balances there. And then you get to uh, there, the judicial is out in the back and beyond somewhere working on other stuff. And that's it. There's no checks and balances which is why I think it suddenly became clear to me. And there's a huge disconnect because we all think this scares me to death. It's like, we're all taught that we have something that does not exist, at least not at the local level. Anyway, there's my, I, I, I'm done with my I, 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 <laughs> I, I don't know what the answer is to that because don't forget mm -hmm. my, my researchers go back to hundred years ago and time, time has moved on. But in the end, the people who will control local government are those who turn up, those who vote. Well, and, and I take it a step further, and, and maybe another time we can talk about how it happens in the UK, because I'm very interested, and I think other people would be, and quite honestly, I ignored it when... I was there because I couldn't vote anyway. <laughs> and they were so rude to each other in the Houses of Parliament, it turned me off. So, but it, I don't know if they were as corrupt as we can eat. But anyway, um, maybe they were just rude. But um, it, it depends, depends how you want to define the word as corrupt. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, as you probably know, there is a competition going on as to who is going to become the next prime minister. Yeah. Now, None of the people who are standing um, are corrupt, so far as I am aware, in terms of taking bribes, making threats, and trying to abuse using money. But the lies they are telling about what they are going to do if they win, well, I think that's about as corrupt as you can get. Because most of them are saying we're going to reduce your taxes. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, you're the people who put them up in the first place. Um, don't try and fool me. Uh, our system's awful. It's just awful. <laughs> Churchill said, said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the rest. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, I agree with them on that. I wish we had a little more democracy, <laughs> which you well, already uh, mentioned. I, oh, now, I, I don't want to suggest that you should move from a beautiful place in California or Hawaii, uh, but you might consider Minneapolis St. Paul. Some well, years ago. Hmm, that's some years I have ago. A lot of, I have some distant family covers distant cousins in minneapolis that's where uh, it's, it's where, where my wife it's where my wife comes from uh, oh, i didn't some, know you had an american wife oh yes <laughs> yes I'm not, man. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not i'm i'm not hemp picked i'm eagle pig right. <laughs> that's worse <laughs> but um i i uh, for my master's dissertation 
it started a group called the Citizens League of mm. Minnesota. This is a group of volunteers who meet to discuss good, write a law, and then propose it to the state government. And I have never seen anything like it. And I, um, I got to interview an awful lot of people uh, involved in it. And I think it's just absolutely brilliant. But then, That's great. But then I think Minnesota is a bit unusual because it's still a, it's still a we society, not a me society. Well, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I, there's a whole bunch, there's a study now that the United Nations has done and they've uh, been using uh, Gallup poll, uh, international Gallup polling uh, data for it. And it's, they call it the happiness study, but every year they focus on a different aspect of, of which, com which countries are happiest and, and what influences it. And the single most important factor is low corruption in government. And following on from that is that people trust their government agencies because they're quality agencies, they deliver. Um, they look after people when people come across adversity and they're trusted to do that and people participate. And, oh, tell me where, where to go, I'll move. Scandinavia, Scandinavia, <laughs> of course. And Minneapolis, as, as I might add, it being one of them is made up of a lot of Scandinavians. And when they looked at <laughs> that, what were the reasons for that? And, and these were more opinions. They were looking at history, kind of like we have. They were looking at history and they realized that these countries had cycles of integrity. And they talk about cycles of corruption being really difficult to break, but so are cycles of integrity difficult to break. And they had a completely different background than your, yours and mine, if we're talking, calling it, you be UK, I'll be America. And um, they, they had always had, they didn't have big business as such. People were more independent, small farmers or fishers, and um, they didn't have slaves. They treated people, they had a more egalitarian society. And um, they, they actually had a cleaner, cleaner history. And um, <laughs> they had, especially in Scandinavia, the Lutheran church, um, it wasn't so much that it controlled the country as it, it, it had a big influence on the ethics. And um, anyway, I, I, I got offline there because I, I did want to talk a little bit about the original progressives. And I don't know if you had looked at that um, or had any comments on the original progressives and, and how they influenced uh, what happened in terms of cycles. Of, let's talk integrity again. In, uh, in terms it, of integrity. It's extraordinary people because they from, they're from every single part of the political. There was no ideological politics here. They were after what was good and what was right. <clears throat> but dealing with a society where there wasn't a big middle class um, and where the cities would just be unable to cope with <coughs> enormous immigration, um, the real problem for the progressives was that uh, they couldn't have the federal government pass a law for every state, except the appointment of senators. So they had to go to battle state by state to get their reforms done. Um, there's some wonderful books about it mm. that I have read. And I, this is this is the trouble, actually, when you get to my age, that I, would, I, know, I know the author of these books so well, and yet, because he's well, right I know, uh, and I forgot his name. Yeah, I know um, Steffens reported a lot. Uh, he was a muckraking journalist, but he reported a lot on 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 uh, the values that yeah. some of the early progressives. Have started. you have you come across a magazine called McClure's? I have. Yeah. Well, uh huh. And you'll know it's not been published for an awful long time, uh, but McClure's magazine was the magazine for muckrakers. It, it, it produced all the stories. Um, women going into dye factories and risking their health so they could get a story out about how dangerous the practice was. Stephens and uh, the Chicago meatpacking. There's so many stories about them. But 
by the 1920s, um, America, it seemed, had had its fill of progressives and they die off and it takes a while for them to come back. And, and the things that they espoused um, from some of my reading was they were looking for, you're absolutely right, not, you'd said nonpartisanship, mm. and they were looking for honest government. They, they wanted government that was fiscally responsible. And um, I'm, try, I'm trying to remember too, but um, they had some strong values that brought apparently actually created the cycles of happiness in in this country and when i when i started looking at the happiness studies i i started finding online that there there are historical studies showing that happiness is created by lack of uh oh, corruption in government and you know <laughs> indirectly i can totally understand that because that's really what one of the things that motivates me to, to write about it is um it really it it breaks my heart to see that in our county we we have a few now I've been railing about it for quite a while. I'm not going to say I put them there at all, but um, we have a few rehab beds and a few mental health beds, but I would say it's still pretty close to none. And I noticed when I was mayor that other counties had rehab and mental health beds. And I, I, um, I realized that when all the money is going somewhere else, then it can't be put into the things that people really desperately need and families really suffer. And we have a greater degree of homelessness because we don't have services to treat mental health and 95% of people who are homeless have had um, either rehab or and or mental health issues. And not that it will solve homelessness, but it will it will help and it will certainly um, help. In our county, even the corrupt supervisor who committed suicide before that had to go two counties away for rehab. And um, that's what happens in families. You have a child or a parent who has mental health and so it, it I, I got off track there but um it's really I, I don't know I lost no, myself I, I, I lost can, my train of thought there I but can, that's what motivates me look I've read this I can tell you care about an awful lot of things that people need to care about mm. um but I can't compare life here with America mm. um one of my daughters lives in Flagler Beach, North my in uh, North Florida, mm. and when I hear about what she has to go through to get health care, yeah. oh. I I, I fail to understand what is what's the matter with America. Um, <laughs> but then I have to listen to Americans who tell me that we have socialized medicine here and that. Um, the government can decide whether to kill you or not. So, <laughs> which well, is not quite the case. Frankly, I'd rather be killed by the government than by a, a for profit <laughs> insurance company. Because <laughs> it works, as, you know, I know no system is good, but I lived in Britain for 20 years and, um, my medical, I got great medical care. I lived in a, a small community and, you know, the, the GP, the general practitioner took care of everything. And, um, you know, if you had a bad GP, you had a problem, <laughs> but I didn't. So, I mean, I knew him, we knew him, we lived in the village mm -hmm. and, um, and that was that it worked very well. And everybody here says, Oh, but the taxes, the taxes. Well, I can tell you, I had a lot of friends in the UK who were doctors and one of them came to visit and she was horrified. And the doctors are paid well in Britain. It's not like they suffer over there because um, everybody here thinks, well, then they must not pay the doctors. Um, she was horrified when I told her how much I pay for health insurance. But then on, it's not just that I have to pay for health insurance and my medications, but on top of that, I have to pay a copay. And um, on top of that, sometimes I still have to pay to go to the doctor. And when you add that up, plus you're still paying taxes for some of that, um, it is exponentially more here. And we all believe the lie that it costs more in Britain. And frankly, I didn't pay any more in taxes when I lived in the UK than I do here. Well, um, you know, here it's I'm going to call it bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, um, it, is, it is quite staggering, actually, what, what the National Health Service can provide. 
And mm-hmm. I'd be happy to make, pay more taxes towards it. Um, mm-hmm. But there we are. We're, we're, we're running... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I know you, it's been an hour and, and you probably need to get yeah. some dinner, but maybe sometime we'll, we'll get together again and have another chat. And thanks. Thanks to Linda well, for her patience. Well, I, I'd be delighted. And, you know, unfortunately, I can't travel to America anymore because uh, I can't get insurance and I will not come without it. Well, it's the age and everything. Uh, but if you're ever headed this way, I would be delighted to see you. Really well, nice. thank you. Thank you. Because I, I have been just so anxious to get over and see my friends in Scotland and, and some in London as well. So you may find me <laughs> getting if into I it. You, if I, you, I, I, I give it a year for the pandemic to die down a bit and for us to have a little bit of sense in government, which seems to be missing at the moment. <laughs> Well, and that's why I haven't come. It's the whole pandemic thing and my friends are older and I want to make sure everybody's comfortable because I want to see them when I get there. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> thank you true. so much, John, for your time. My pleasure. And LJ, thank you for your time. Love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we'll, okay. we'll talk again. <laughs> I hope so. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.